Hey, Jason, it's Mark uh, living here in Europe, the Czech Republic. I'm down at my Airbnb in Austria right now. And I just wanted to congratulate you on a, the thousandth show. Uh, congratulations on all the shows. You probably don't hear from only a fraction, probably don't hear from most people, just how much the shows have helped, how much we listen to them, how much we appreciate them, and just all the best. Congrats. Welcome to this week's edition of Flashback Friday, your opportunity to get some good review by listening to episodes from the past that Jason has handpicked to help you today in the present and propel you into the future. Enjoy. Welcome to Creating Wealth with Jason Hartman. During this program, Jason is going to tell you some really exciting things that you probably haven't thought of before and a new slant on investing. Fresh new approaches to America's best investment that will enable you to create more wealth and happiness than you ever thought possible. Jason is a genuine, self-made, multimillionaire who not only talks the talk, but walks the walk. He's been a successful investor for 20 years and currently owns properties in 11 states and 17 cities. This program will help you follow in Jason's footsteps on the road to financial freedom. You really can do it. And now, here's your host, Jason Hartman, with the complete solution for real estate investors. Welcome to the Creating Wealth Show. This is your host, Jason Hartman. This is episode number 363. And I want to apologize in advance if the audio quality isn't as good as usual today because I am recording just simply directly to the computer. But I've got a special guest back for the third time, and that is my mom. We're here at her uh, McMansion, this Tara. ridiculous McMansion, Tara, in Alabama. And I was at a conference in New Orleans, as you know, it uh, on the last episode. And so I've been here for a couple of days. And I know uh, you regular listeners and attendees of my seminars have been interested in hearing the story about how she builds this house. But we're going to talk about one of her tenants today and some of her different property management experiences. And we're going to play for you a an almost hilarious phone message that she got from one of her tenants. And what I really want to focus on with you today, before we get to our guest, who, by the way, is Scott Shalliday talking about derivatives. Not sure if I mentioned that or not. But anyway, that'll be our guest here in a few minutes. But what we want to talk about today is fostering an ownership mentality with your tenants. And what I mean by that is this. Sometimes you have to train your tenants. Sometimes you have to train your property managers. And that, of course, depends if you're self-managing your properties or if you're using property managers. But you have to ultimately train either the manager or the tenant to understand that when people rent a single-family home or a unit in a duplex or a fourplex or even in a large apartment complex that you might own, we want to foster a mentality of ownership, like they're the owner, and they should be doing a lot of things to the property. And you shouldn't have to deal with every little thing. I remember one of my property managers in a uh, Pensacola, Florida property that I owned emailed me and they said, there are ants. Will you authorize paying for an exterminator to come over for, you know, to exterminate the ants? And I'm thinking, no, this is ridiculous. I mean, that's a ridiculous request. Now, just so you know, I, uh, I gave up ownership of my own home about two and a half years ago, and I rented a really swanky high-end penthouse in the Phoenix, Arizona area when I moved. And, you know, I kind of like being a renter in a lot of ways, especially, you know, from a large institutional landlord where they, you know, if, if a light bulb burns out, they come and change the light bulb for me. I mean, it's, <laughs> isn't that crazy, mom? <laughs> Ridiculous. Yeah. So, so, but that's not the kind of experience I'm going to provide for a tenant who's renting a single family home from me. I want them to act like a homeowner. I want them to take care of things and fix things and, and not call me for every little thing. And when I've talked in the past about the idea of self-management at a long distance, which I have successfully done, and my mother, who you're about to hear from, has definitely successfully done for many years, I understand that self-management is not for everybody. It's only for some people. The rest of the people will want to have a property manager. But in either case, it's important to train the manager or train the tenant so that you are not bogged down with little tiny issues. 
Okay, and this is easy to do. It's not difficult to do at all. So here's my mom, Joyce, and how you doing? Fine, Jason. Good. Well, I've enjoyed staying here at your McMansion for the last couple of days, and I've told our listeners, and I've learned my lesson from you, that I never want to build a house. <laughs> This is like a ridiculous project. And and since many of the regular listeners, you know, they've kind of asked about your, your house all the time here. How long have you been building this place? Three years? Four years? The original builder started in uh, the end of 2008. And then we, oh had, we had a parting of the ways in two th- at the very end of 2009. And I came down here and I had to find everybody to do everything because a couple of days ago I was going through old pictures and I happened to find a picture of this house as it was turned over to me after he left the job. All it had was drywall. Yeah. So you obviously know it did have plumbing inside of those walls, which leaked like crazy one time and destroyed a whole bunch of flo- uh, stuff. Anyway, that's why it has taken me so long, because obviously I'm not a builder. Well, and you're you're a perfectionist, and you want it a certain way, obviously, because this has always been your dream to build your southern mansion. Right. Uh, but I tell you, when I owned that traditional real estate company, and we served a lot of clients, you know, wealthier clients in Irvine, Newport Beach, California, Southern California, we'd see, actually, it wasn't funny, it was tragic, but we would see these couples, you know, who were wealthy people, they buy, you know, a, a very expensive lot in, say, Newport Coast, California, and with the intent of building their dream mansion, you know, and the whole project altogether would probably cost them eight, ten million dollars. And <laughs> invariably, that that is something that will massively increase the divorce rate, because building a home is not for the faint of heart. What would you say about that? I would agree with you one hundred percent. Would you do it again? No. Good. I, I I'm would, glad you said I that. I would take any house and rip off the front, do whatever it took, but I would not go from scratch again. So, so it's easier to fix something up and rehab it than build it from scratch, obviously. I think so. Yeah, yeah. But what I really think, as I've talked about on the shows before and I'm trying to convince you of, is that you, you know, if it's an expensive home, it's just such a better deal to rent it because the rent elasticity is just not there. A $2 million home can be rented for... Forty five hundred to maybe five six thousand dollars per month, so that's a, about a quarter of a percent rent to value ratio. When you're the tenant, it's favorable to you to rent the high end home. But if you invested two million dollars through my network in in the different areas that I'd recommend people invest, ideally they'd get one percent, if not even a little bit better than that. So they'd get twenty thousand dollars per month. So sometimes it's better to rent than own. And that's that's been my philosophy since I uh, found that swanky penthouse bargain in Phoenix, you know. Because, you know, I sold my home in Southern California. I was in Orange County. And I sold that house for just under a million dollars. Uh, of course, it was a pretty downtime in the market. And I thought of putting it up for rent. And the most I could have gotten for rent for that house that was almost a million would have been about 4000 per month. Maybe 4200 if I was lucky. And I thought, gosh, if I just want to deploy a million dollars through our network and buy 10 $100,000 houses that rent for $1,000 a month each, it's better to rent my high-end home for myself and rent a lot of lower middle houses to other people, right? Yes, just because the expenses on fixing up the lower end houses don't cost as much. When you have repairs to a high end house, those repairs are expensive. Yeah, yeah. I mean all the fixtures and the fittings, it's this is the first time I actually stayed here. I saw your house before as it's been in the various stages of its very long construction project. But you've got fourteen foot ceilings, moldings that are about a foot thick. I don't know, those are like all dentals. <laughs> Yeah, dentals, dental moldings, and it's just incredible, you know, the amount of money you've spent on this. I think you've over-improved. Would you agree with that, too? Well, not in my mind. <laughs> <laughs> but I think you have. You've got, you know, 9,600 square feet here, and we're sitting on the back patio now, but looking at the unfinished backyard. Now, when are you going to finish the backyard, Mom? Well, I had to do the inside stuff first. Now, tomorrow, my chandeliers are arriving, and just you will just, be gone. I will be gone, Yeah. <laughs> So uh, anyway, interesting. Okay, well, hey, anything else you want to mention about why people shouldn't build a house or this experience? But then let's talk about, you know, the tenants and investing. I I just think it's 
better to have some very good builder do all of that stuff for you yeah. rather than you get involved in yeah. it. And it's better to buy it on the resale market and then fix it a little bit the way you want it. But but even better than that is to just rent it. <laughs> yeah, I would agree. You'd agree. Okay, good. Well, so you've had some long-term tenants in your properties. The longest one you've had has been there a quarter of a century. Yes, you did hear that right. 25 years since 1989. You've had this one tenant. We're about to play a phone message from this tenant, which I think you'll really get a kick out of, uh, listeners, <laughs> because because you have really fostered a culture of like an ownership mentality with the tenant where he's doing all kinds of stuff to improve the value of your property. It's really amazing. Maybe we should start out by just playing the phone message, okay? Yeah, I and was then, amazed with what he had done. <laughs> and, and then and then tell the background. But, you know, he's he's been there, this one tenant, 25 years. You've had other tenants for seven, eight, nine years, I know. You know, maybe you can give a little more detail on that. But but here's the phone message, okay? Just listen to this. I think you'll, you'll all get a kick out of this. Uh, Joyce, where do I start? Okay. Put a new... So just so you understand, this is the tenant calling my mom to give a report on what he's done to improve her property. Okay, so that's just giving you a little context. Here we go. Front yard in. It cost fourteen hundred bucks. He put a front yard in for fourteen hundred dollars. Because you said we couldn't grow grass there. Just throw some seed down and it grow. Well, they wouldn't. So anyway, that's in, and I just cut it right now. Also. Put a brick wall in on the west side of the house because the neighbors had pit bulls and the fence that was up there, they uh, wouldn't fix. We couldn't take a chance on their dogs getting over in our yard when I'm not there and attacking our dogs. So that cost three grand. So your tenant put in a $3,000 fence at his expense? <laughs> I, I'm a, I, I nearly fell over when I heard this phone conversation. <laughs> It's amazing. <laughs> and he's giving you a full report. I just love it. Okay, let's go on. Place the sink faucet in the kitchen, the one that you had the guy next door do, because it wouldn't stop leaking. That cost 50 some bucks. The mailbox, I haven't got, I got it, but I haven't put it in yet. And uh, there's one or two other things. Oh, and last but not least, there was an earthquake. Uh, I don't know, I guess two weeks ago, and it uh, looks like it uh, damaged the water heater because now I've noticed when I was back there cleaning that there was water leaking out of that room. So I opened the door, and it looks like the water is leaking out from the water heater. It's dripping. It's not pouring out. It's just a drip. We haven't noticed it because um, so I haven't been back there, but... I went back there today and I noticed it. So that's what's going on. I don't know what you want to do about it or how you want to deal with this or whatever, but probably going to need a water heater. So I can put it in if you get one. I put the last one in. So shouldn't have too much problem. So it doesn't have to be today. I'm pretty sure we haven't noticed a loss of water or anything. So probably can be, uh, the weekend or something. I have the truck has got a dead battery in it. I tried to get it started today and it wouldn't start, so I have to go get a new battery for it today. So I ain't gonna be able to do it today anyway. Patty's at the hospital, so I'm on my own. So anyway, that's what's going on. I thought I'd let you know. Have a nice day. Toodaloo. I love the toodaloo at the end. <laughs> It's funny. <laughs> he's a funny guy. So he replaced the last water heater for you. Well, and now he's replacing the new one for you. Yes. I mean, I was going to have, you know, someone do it. And uh, he got anxious and he says, Oh, I'll go pick it up and do it myself. Isn't this great? So how do you get it? I mean, I've had some tenants like I remember, my, I think one of my best people was my guy in Houston, in one of my Houston properties. And, and he was, uh, I, I talked about this on a prior episode, he was an engineer. And he uh, helped uh, design oil drilling platforms for one oh, of the wow. oil companies. Now, Houston is 
Houston's a great place to invest. I love Houston because it's got that transient, highly paid tenant base, you know, where they move there for a couple of years. And then, you know, like this guy, that guy I'm just talking about, I, I think his name was Paul. Yeah, Paul was his name, I'm pretty sure. And, you know, he was married and it was he just he and his wife and the property. But he got shipped off to some foreign country. I think he's in the Middle East now. You know, he uh, works, you know, helps him design and maintain these oil drilling platforms. But he was so handy, he did everything for me. It's like uh, he moved in with a couple things that were unfinished, and I didn't have a property manager. I was self-managing that property. And listen, I knew, live nowhere near Houston, okay? At the time, I lived in Southern California, or maybe I just moved to Arizona about two, two and a half years ago. Anyway, he got me quotes and like fixed a bunch of stuff. There was only one thing he couldn't fix. It was an electrical thing he couldn't figure out. He tried to figure it out and he just couldn't figure it out. So, uh, but he, but he was fixing all kinds of stuff for me. I mean, I thought this is great. And you know, look at folks, this is what people should expect. A lot of life comes down to setting proper expectations, right? And in a single family home type of rental scenario, they, it's not like you're going to come out and change the light bulbs for them, to use that metaphor, or spray for ants. I mean, if someone calls me and says there's some ants, I, I say, you go to the supermarket and you buy some fogger and some raid or black flag spray. And I mean, this is not like this. It's not like being in a hotel or an apartment building. Okay. What do you say about that? Well, I, I that's absolutely correct. And there's nothing that would bother me worse than having some tenant call me up and tell me that the light doesn't work and what it really needs is a light bulb a new light bulb <laughs> i mean that is just ridiculous so you know you kind of have to set that pace with a tenant the day you sign the lease and i always inquire as to whether or not they are kind of handy that really helps me know what I, what what what's going to happen in the future but with this tenant that has done so many things. Now, none of these things that he called me up and talked to me on the phone that he had done, the $3,000 for the fence and... Uh, $1,400 for the front yard. For, for the front yard. And the faucet was 50 bucks. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, we had not discussed any of these expenses beforehand, so by rights, I would not have to pay any of these expenses. Because they were, yeah, right. right. I mean, he went ahead and did them entirely on his own, and don't and believe me, I am highly appreciative of what he has yeah, done. Right. But the water heater I will gladly take care of. Sure. There's just no problem. Well, with yeah, it. but right, but but all you're gonna end up doing and when we were at the movies yesterday, he called just before the movie started, I remember we saw what did we see? A winter's tale? A winter's tale. Yeah. That good was, movie. That was pretty good. And anyway, he called and he said that he was doing the water are you just gonna pay for the parts? Is he gonna do all the labor? Well, he'll he will pick up the water heater. The water heater, so I won't have to pay the store to deliver it. Mm -hmm. And if he needs any uh, parts, of course, I'll pay for them. Yeah, yeah. So, but he's doing the labor. You've oh, got free course, labor. Of yeah. course. Wow, that's fantastic. And by the way, this tenant we should mention is a truck driver. Yes. Okay. That's one thing. That's setting expectations when you have the tenant, kind of set the pace as you say. But what if you have a property manager? Let's talk about training them a little bit. Now, I have some tips on that. I think what's really important with a property manager and with most things in life is the way you begin the relationship. That's the That sets the tone, usually. And you can fix it later if you didn't begin the relationship right, but it's a little bit harder to do that Definitely. because you're, you know, it's kind of an uphill, you're swimming upstream, if you will. So with a property manager, what I do is I'm always careful whenever I have a new property manager, and keep in mind, just so you know, some of my properties I'm self-managing from a distance, and some of them, you know, some of them are 1,500, 2,000 miles away from me, and I'm self-managing, but sometimes I have a property manager, and my rule on that, again, and I've talked about this at length in, in other episodes, so look back in the archives and, and listen to some of my talks about self-management if you're interested in that. But if there's a property manager, I make it a point to really, really look carefully at their statements in the very beginning of the relationship, especially that first three months. I want to look and I want to nitpick and I want to be picky and I want to email them and call them out on every little thing. Even if I don't actually object to it, I'm going to make up a fake objection so they'll know I'm paying attention, 
They'll know I'm not a client who's a pushover, and that's what I want them to know. Any thoughts, Mom? A- absolutely, because uh, with one of my tenants, the, this was before I started managing everything myself. Um, yeah, and by the way, we should say you're a hundred percent self-managed, and you have properties. And oh, I got to tell another funny story. I took a picture of this. You picked me up in New Orleans, which is about three hours away from from here. <laughs> this, you know what I'm going to say, right? <laughs> and and where were we driving by? We we you drive through Gulf, Mississippi yeah. to come here, and you have a property in Gulfport, Mississippi. Yeah. And what did we have to do, Mom? As we, we were <laughs> <laughs> we had to just take we had to stop at this exit because people keep calling me about this sign, and I'm sick of answering the phone or not answering the phone, which is the rude thing to do, you know, because you never know. Maybe you want to rent to that tenant eventually. (laughs) Anyway, I had to stop and go take the sign off the telephone pole at Walmart. (laughs) No, it was was Home Depot. Oh, Home Home Depot, Depot. yeah. Yeah, Yeah, so so basically we had to get off the freeway in Gulfport on the way here (laughs) because she had one of her for rent signs was still on a telephone pole there. And I love how unprofessional you are. What I mean by that is you take a big, thick magic marker, a Sharpie, you know, a big, thick one, and you you take plain corrugated plastic signs, and you just write... 18 by 24. 18 by 24 inch signs, and you write in your own hand, home for rent, Uh I think is what you said. You didn't say house, you say home. Home for rent. Yeah, yeah. And then you, you write the address. Yes. And you write telephone number. You're, anything else? I can't remember. Nothing. Yeah. So so I got out of the car and I tore the sign off the telephone pole. It had two nails in it. And you just go around and do that all yourself, don't you? That's so funny. <laughs> and, but it's so inexpensive to do that. And it is so convenient. You don't have to take stuff to a printer. You know, if they make mistakes in your phone numbers. I mean, they charge you a whole bunch of money to do that. All you do is find a local printer who will sell you these little corrugated 18 by 24 plastic things for 99 cents yeah. each. So you buy these white signs for 99 cents each. Then you write on them with a magic marker. My uh, Folks, I just got to tell you, I'm not like this. My mom is the ultimate do-it-yourselfer. <laughs> she really is. And I don't necessarily recommend that for I'm you. A, I'm a hands-on person. Yeah, you really are. So we had to take down the sign because people kept calling about the house for rent, and it yeah. was already rented, right? Yeah. So what else but, about But the point is, no. when people start calling on your house for rent, on your home for rent signs, mm-hmm. always ask, where did you see that sign? Because then you will know the most profitable places to put the signs up in the future. Right. (laughs) Good point. Good point. Okay. And what what else should we say about setting the tone or setting the expectations with either your tenants or or your managers? Well, this manager went out and replaced the outside uh, light bulbs. And charged them? Really? Yeah, and, and, you know, and so anyway, I said, I am refusing to pay for that. So they took it off the next month. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, you just you just have to let them know that some of these things are absolutely ridiculous. Yeah. Now, the tenant is responsible for replacing the light bulbs right. whenever they burn out, whether they're inside or they're outside. This is not, these are not 300 unit apart, luxury apartment complexes where you know, it's treated like a hotel would be treated, right? If I was staying in a hotel, I would certainly expect them to replace the light bulbs. In my apartment building, the built-in lights, they if one burns out, I just email the landlord and they come and replace them, which is, you know, I would never expect that if I was renting a single family home. It's just not what we do. Well, the other thing is you need to instill a sense of pride in that tenant. For example, if the dishwasher goes out, if that person is handy, I say, I am happy to buy you the new dishwasher to make it convenient for you and your wife so you're not dealing with an old, incompetent dishwasher. But you put it in. And I'll be happy to buy one for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, So you sort of make a deal. And that's another thing I do, by the way, is not exactly like that. But another thing that I've done is I've, you know, when there are sort of things that are like these borderline requests, uh like the tenant would like to do, I mean, I don't get as good a deal. Nobody gets the deals you get. Okay. (laughs) 
<laughs> but I remember one time they wanted to build a fence or make a higher fence or something like that. And, you know, the land, the manager, I had a property manager on that one. And they said, you know, will you pay for it? I said, no, I'm not going to pay for that. It's not. Why should it's not, you? Why should I? But I did offer to pay for a portion of it. I think I paid like 30% and the tenant paid the rest. So the tenant is paying to improve my property. And of course, I always want to see pictures of before and after. And, you know, I want to see the actual receipts from for any parts or Oh, they must, they must send like. the receipts. Yeah, yeah, of course. And, and so that's what, what you need to do. Okay, so instill a sense of pride, a culture of ownership mentality. Anything else? Yeah, you, you say, look, at this is your home. Uh, nobody is going to come and disturb you in your home. I don't bother you. I don't come around and plant new flowers and keep looking at what you are doing. This is your home, and you feel a sense of pride living in it, and obviously you should be taking care of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, good, good point. Any other tips you can give on uh, – any property management things, just anything in general or anything more on this topic? Just act in a very businesslike, professional way, always with your tenants and be concerned about them. But don't be overly friendly. It's it's a business proposition. You expect your rent on the very first day of the month. There's absolutely no leeway, three days, five days, anything like that, because it's just like you're receiving a paycheck. It's just like when they receive their paycheck, if their boss tells them, gee, I can't pay you till three days later, that doesn't work with them. So therefore, it shouldn't work with you on receiving your rent. Now, what also, with that in mind, what do you do as far as, uh, I, I mean, you're, you're managing all your properties yourself nowadays, and they're scattered all over the country. Okay, these are not near you. You don't own any in your city, right? No. <laughs> yeah. Thank goodness. Yeah. Oh, now why do you say Yes, that? I have a P.O. box that everyone mails to. Yeah. Oh, no, that's what I was going to ask. But you have, most of your tenants do deposit right into your bank account, right? Yes, yeah. That's, okay. the, that's the convenient thing. There's no longer anything, well, I put it in the mail. Within, no within seconds, you know if that deposit is there. Okay. So they just walk in. You bank with a national bank, uh-huh. and they just walk into a branch, and they deposit it, and you just look and see that that money is in, in there. Right. Okay. Right. And, and you uh, always prorate for the first of the month. Okay. So, oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. And when That's it, when they first move in. Right, right. But they don't always move in on the first of the month. That is correct. Right. So you, you make the proration. Sure. Now, talk a little bit about that because that's interesting. When you rent to a tenant, you always get certified funds, right? So they're good yes, funds. Yes, or cash. Yeah, or cash. And so you take cash, actually. Oh, of course. Oh, wonderful. Gosh. <laughs> Or something else. I can see you walking around with three thousand dollars from the tenant. Well, you immediately get to the bank <laughs> yeah, and deposit it. Okay. So when you do the proration, say for example they move in on the thirteenth of the month, right? We'll mm-hmm. pick a lucky number, lucky thirteen, okay. right? And they move in on the thirteenth. How do you do that proration? You get the security deposit plus. Do you get a full first month rent and then prorate the second month so you, that you, you get, get more money? The, from- the rent goes from the thirteenth of the month they move in till the 13th of the next month. Right. But then on the next month, on the very first day of that month, they pay you that smaller amount of rent. Right. So, so up front. And it's always based on 30 days. Don't try to. Yeah. Be prorations funny. are always 30 days, whether yeah. the month is 28 or 31, it's 30 days is yeah. how prorations always work. But what I want to say is that so you get a full first month up front, even if they moved in on the 28th of the month and there were 31 days, you'd get a full month. Yeah, good. Absolutely. Not three days, whereas some people have been oh, fooled no, by oh, that. No, yeah. oh, no, okay. Oh, no. okay. And then you get a full security deposit. Now, how do you calculate your security deposits usually? Well, if the person would really have bad credit and I would be leery of them somewhat, I would charge them more than one month security. Mm-hmm. Okay. And that came in a good stead uh, recently when I had to do an eviction in Long Beach. Okay. Anyway, always get at least a month, a minimum of one month. Yeah, so you get one month security plus a full first month rent. You prorate the second month. Now, 
you know, I used to get sometimes, uh, although I don't do it all the time, but even more than one month's rent. Oh, well, if you can, yeah. <laughs> by all for, means. For the security deposit, I Oh, mean. absolutely. Yeah. And I never collect last month's rent because the, uh, the, thing, no. the thing that landlords need to understand, and of course tenants need to understand, is that the security deposit cannot be used as the last month's rent. That's your security deposit. So the tenant doesn't get to... Once they give their notice, say, hey, I already gave you that security deposit for $1,500. That'll cover me. No, it won't. If you don't pay the rent this month, I'm going to file an eviction. No, okay? uh, look, at, look, at that's a whole illegal situation of it now. Is. Yeah. It's, it's first month rent plus security deposit. There's no such thing as, as first and rent. last. Right. Yeah. That went by the wayside uh, a years long time ago, ago. Years ago, yeah. So never do that. Talk to us about credit. You said you would rent to people with bad credit. I want to talk to you about pets because your tenant, when we played that funny phone message, did, did mention his dogs. So let's talk about pet rent. Let's talk about credit reports because a lot of Otherwise, pretty good tenants have very bad credit nowadays because of the financial crisis. And, you know, as landlords, we have to look at that from a positive perspective. That is going to keep them in the rental pool for years to come. So, right? <laughs> Touche. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Don't not rent to a tenant. Uh, because he has bad credit. And I tell the tenant, look, we're going to run a credit report. We are not going to turn you down on the basis of that alone. We are interested in two things, how much you earn and that it is enough so that you can pay your rent every month and how well did you pay your last landlord. Those are the two things that I am most concerned with. The fact that the tenant has bad credit means that he can't go out and buy a house and move out of your uh, rental right, right. away. Yeah. And so that that bad credit is going to keep him as a very good tenant for you for quite a while. So what do you do with, with bad credit? Like, Do you really look at the FICO score? Do you look at specific derogatories on the credit report? Or how do you make the decision as to how much the security deposit will be? And I'll give an example before you speak because I remember many years ago you gave me this idea. I had a tenant and it was in a California property many years ago, which turned out to be not that great a deal, <laughs> unfortunately. But, but anyway, I had this tenant and he had recently declared bankruptcy. And the maximum rent I could, and I, you know, remember, I was just a kid back then. I didn't know anything, but I just remember I had to call and research and figure out, you know, this may, this was actually before the internet. Mm. <laughs> okay. Wow. <laughs> so I had to call and research and figure out that the maximum legal amount I was allowed to collect was three months rent on a furnished place and two months rent as security deposit on an unfurnished Correct. place. And this was unfurnished. And what you said to me is you said, you know, I came to you for advice and you said, Jason, just have him pay rent in advance. And he did. He paid me. Now get this, folks. He paid me six mm -hmm. months rent in advance plus the maximum legal security deposit. And after the six months was up, you know, he just started paying. So it worked out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What else would you say? You can do that. Uh, you, can, you, can I, pay, I, you can accept advance rent in most places, probably all, I'm not sure, but laws vary from city to city, state to state, okay? so I, I think I actually did that also. I, I, I don't remember the details, but yeah. uh, they, they had bad credit, and I, I don't remember the circumstances, but I think I did accept or, uh, about four months' rent. Four in months' advance. rent, yeah, plus the maximum mm -hmm. liable security deposit. So that's one thing you can do. I mean, some of these tenants, really oddly, almost have enough down payment for a house that to like to buy one, but their credit won't allow them to buy one. So that makes them a great tenant for you. And it's a win-win situation because they need housing and they can't do it any other way and you're going to provide it for them. Just make sure that the deal is equitable, of course. Now, let's talk about pets. We, we both are animal lovers, you and I, and I remember when I was a kid, I had a couple of cats and then uh, dogs, and we both like those a lot, but we've never seen them improve the value of one of our properties, have we? <laughs> <laughs> Not exactly. <laughs> so so what do you do about pets? Now, what I try and do, although some property managers, frankly, think this is like a crazy foreign idea, and I, again, have to educate them, I charge pet rent. And institutional landlords do this all the time. They'll charge $40 a month if you want to have a dog. And they'll limit the weight of the dog, usually to 30 or 40 pounds. They just do it by weight. And they'll also say it can't be younger than one year. Because then, you know, with a dog, you got a puppy who's obviously going to go to the bathroom in, in all Everywhere. the wrong places, right? So what do you do about pets, Mom? 
Well, until I had a conversation with you earlier today, I was just charging. Yeah, you were uh, just charging uh, a security, uh, uh, really a one-time uh, fee for the pet. Correct. But correct. but I said charge it every month. Yes, yeah, yeah. I'm going to do that now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I taught you something. <laughs> oh, good, good. Any other things you want to close with before we get to today's guest, which is uh, Scott Shalliday, to talk about derivatives. I just think that it's easy to manage your own properties. The longer you do it, the easier it gets. And why pay all that money to a manager? But I know some people aren't as hands-on as I am. Yeah. And, and in the interest of full disclosure, we should also say you are retired. You don't have a day job anymore. This yeah. is your day job, right? Yeah, is, correct. Is managing your properties. So uh, managing your properties and building this house, which is a ridiculous project. So if you're working full-time, which most of our clients are, use a property manager. Now, I've self-managed from a far and done it successfully without, uh, in, in some ways, and I just want to say this one more thing before we go, I have mentioned it on past episodes, but in some ways, oddly, and it took me doing this to realize what was, what was going on, what the dynamic was, but in some ways, I think that when there's not some amorphous company managing the property, the tenant sort of wants to maintain a good relationship with the owner and they don't ask for a lot of stuff when it's when they got to come to you directly. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? They don't bug you. They want to maintain a good relationship. When it's a management company, it's sort of like the government. It's like, when you know, what I always say about government, when it's everybody's money, it's nobody's money. Nobody cares, right? So they don't care. They'll just like ask for everything and they'll mm-hmm. just bug the manager incessantly. You got to do this. You got to do that. Spray for ants. I'm not going to lift a finger type of mentality. Change the light bulbs. But when it's a person and they've got to call a person, or email a person, they kind of don't ask for as much a lot of times, right? Would you agree with that? Uh, I, I think so. Yeah. I think so, too. When it is someone impersonal out there, like the property manager, like who is he? He's yeah, just who, who's impersonal. this company? Or yeah, it's a big company, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, but when you have to personal one-on-one with someone, then you're a little bit shyer, I think. Yeah, I agree with you. I think that's true. So so some good tips on management, whether you use a property manager or self-manage, we have a lot of content on past episodes for that. And in the members section at jasonhartman.com, we have even more because we do those monthly conference calls where we've talked about property management and self property management as well. So without further ado, let's do, get to our guest and we'll talk about derivatives, which I affectionately and kind of uh, call in a silly way, I call them the thing about the thing. That's a derivative. How do you like that for a high-tech, sophisticated <laughs> MBA from Harvard explanation, right? <laughs> the thing about the thing. That's what a derivative is. And that's what we're going to talk about with Scott Shalladay. And we'll be back with that in just a second. I'm here with Missy, our newest provider, and she has a great free offer for you. Missy, what is it? Jason, it's a copy of my manual, Landlording Without Losing Your Mind. Fantastic. What does Landlording Without Losing Your Mind teach our listeners? It's a great tool for teaching them how to pick out great rental properties and how to make sure they cash flow. And it's free, and it's available at jasonhartman.com slash cash flow. Again, jasonhartman.com slash cash flow. It's my pleasure to welcome Scott Shalladay to the show. He is Senior Vice President of Derivatives for the Trion Group, and Trion is Irish for strength. He's coming to us today from the greater Chicago area, and Scott, welcome. How are you? I'm good. Thanks for having me. Well, good, good. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. Just in our little discussion before we started recording for the show, I can tell this is going to be an interesting interview. And maybe (laughs) I'd like to start off first by asking you, people talk so much about, at least the doom and gloomers talk so much, about the derivatives bubble and how there are hundreds of trillions of dollars in derivatives out there. And I have never reconciled my mind as to why that is a doom and gloom scenario, because there's a counterparty to every transaction. And you had a great way of explaining that. So first of all, maybe Scott, do you know the estimated size of the derivatives market? No, it's. I, I think it's hard to even estimate because there's a lot of OTC transactions that aren't registered or at least... Uh, an illicit exchange. So uh, hundreds of trillions is right, but the total size is, is going to be very difficult to, to get your head around. I was just going to ask you also, and I, I probably should have asked this first, maybe you can just explain 
what is a derivative? I mean, I kind of simply say it's the thing about a thing. It's the thing about the thing, not the thing itself. <laughs> and just sort of jokingly, but, but explain to the listeners, like, what is a derivative? Well, you're right. It's the thing about a thing. The best way, the best way to be, uh, the best way to explain it would be if you have got, say, corn, there's derivatives on corn. You can trade puts and calls, and those things are kind of complicated, and they get more complicated than that. But you can get, you know, buy the right to, to buy, buy the right to buy or buy the right to sell. So they're, although they can be very difficult, but a lot of times it's just like trading insurance. So I can buy something that, you know, protects me to the upside, or I can buy something that protects me to the downside. And every product out there, whether it be fixed income, commodities or even equities, has something like that. And maybe some of them actually have a derivative of a derivative, but we won't go into that. That gets more complicated. But really, it's just kind of like insurance, but a lot of people use it as a way to oh, I, you know, add more return or you know, create more return for what they, they actually have in their portfolio. And so estimated size of the derivatives market, derivatives market, I know it's hard to tell because some are over-the-counter transactions here. But any, any thoughts on the size? Well, I think you you said something like five hundred trillion or something like that. I, <laughs> I've heard as high as seven hundred trillion. Now, just to put that in perspective, of course, a billion ain't what it used to be. Now we talk in trillions of <laughs> absurdities. Right. You know, thank, thanks to the omnibus bailout programs. That's how we have to talk nowadays. But just to give the listeners some perspective, I mean, the GDP, the gross national product or gross domestic product of the United States of America, the largest economy in the world by far, is about I don't know twelve, thirteen trillion dollars, maybe. The the GDP of the entire planet every year is about sixty trillion dollars. Our unfunded mandate or our unfunded entitlements looking forward about twenty years has been estimated between sixty and two hundred trillion dollars. So I've heard derivatives market is as high as seven hundred trillion. I mean, that's just insane. How can we even think about this? Well, I, I think that the reason derivatives markets are there is in order to cre- create leverage and boy oh boy they have done that i mean that's been their that's been their name, namesake and, and they've been successful in doing so and there's been a lot of money lost and won on both sides of that so yeah that's what they're there for better return maximize return and somehow get some more bang for your buck for your portfolio all right well well should people be worried about when you're worried about the broader economy should you be worried about how many derivatives are floating around out there or is it really a a, a red herring Another good question. I would say, you know, as an old trader would have said to me, you know, if you bet on the sun exploding and you win, you know, what do you really win? So, <laughs> good point. <laughs> so I think that maybe you can get really worried about the size of the derivative markets, but also I think you're probably better served if you just go with the flow and manage your own finances with it because you could, you're just going to be a, you know, a, a fly on the windscreen of, of the derivatives market if you decide to kind of try to get in front of it. So It'd be safe to say that it's better off seeing what you can do and how you can make money living with it rather than kind of putting your head in the sand and trying to fight it. So it's it's something that we, yeah, it's big and it can be very uh, ominous, but at the same time, it can also allow a lot of investors a great way to add more and more money to their portfolio. So. Okay, so it shouldn't be something that people spend a lot of time worried and worrying about. Is that correct? Yes, I think you probably have more of a, you, you better spent worrying about getting in the car or an airplane every day than you would about the size of the derivatives market. Well, we talk about derivatives. A lot of people view those as like these thin air sort of smoke and mirror asset classes. Where should people start when investing in tangible assets? Well, tangible assets, I mean, there's two there's the kind of two different questions there. I mean, tangible assets are, you know, a lot of times people will be as simple as to say that there's things that hurt when I drop them on my foot. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's a good way to look at it. <laughs> and those are the things that are, would be deemed inflation proof or inflation edges against the dollar losing its value over years against the dollar or against the Fed printing more and more money. So it's something I've talked about with other people, but I've got a little acronym called SWAGGER and it's silver, wine, art, gold, energy, and real estate. And all of those things would be inflation hedges. And you've started to see some of them bubble up you know, recently in, in some of the press. And I just actually looked up what the wine market's doing, and that's on fire as well. So here we sit worrying about how many dollars are being flooded in the market, and it's $85 billion a month, according to the Fed. And that'll be a trillion dollars a year we're adding to that balance sheet to try to stimulate growth in the economy with no growth really around the corner. But when we do start to see that growth, that's when this inflation will start to take off. And that's why these, some of these investors have started paying record prices, i.e. $142 million for a Francis Bacon painting a, a week or so ago. 
And that's going to continue because that can be a good store of wealth. At the same time, you can actually have that uh, the uh, the object you bought go up in value. Now, you mentioned something earlier before we went on about, you know, they're also very illiquid. So it's something that you have to be very careful about. But going forward, we're trying to inflate our way out of this problem. And in doing so, hard assets are going to gain in value as well as stocks. The two things that have been gaining in value because of this Fed's inflationary pumping of money have been the real estate market and equities. So keeping that in mind, there's a few things other than real estate like silver and gold, which gold and silver both come off as of late, but those inflation hawks are still there to buy it, will continue to rally over time when that dollar starts to lose its value because we're printing so many of them. Yeah, yeah, no question about it. And so real things, I mean, what I always say is that things matter. They have intrinsic value. You know, money, or we should say currency to be more accurate, is just a symbol of value. And it, it's backed by nothing anymore. So be careful of it. You know, own and control things that have universal need, intrinsic value, those kinds of things are good. Now, you have this interesting acronym, SWAGGER. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, it's that silver, wine, art, gold, energy, and real estate. And those are the things that you just mentioned. Those things have value. Those things may be a store of value for folks that have extra money and are a little bit, say, weary of the stock market here. But it's also a way that really any one of those things, if you drop it on your foot, may hurt, depending on how big your silver or gold bars are. But that could be a way of seeing, uh, hedging yourself against a devaluation of the dollar. And why would the dollar devalue? Well, the dollar devalues when we continue to print so many of them. And then internationally, they don't look as attractive just because of simple supply and demand in our own currency. So with our currency being flooded with new currency or new dollars, these types of things are a good store of wealth or a good store of the dollar value because Quite simply, if I paid $10 for that bottle of wine and the dollar wasn't worth $10 anymore, the dollar was worth 50 cents internationally, then it would cost me $20 to, to, to buy that wine. Well, 10 I sell it at 20 I make money that way. See, it's a store of wealth. That's, that's pretty much why you'll see folks diving into that art market. You see gold bugs diving into gold. You'll see real estate people, both farmers and real estate speculators, hoovering up land because they think that the dollar is stronger today, so they'll be able to buy more with it today than they can next year or in five years' time. So those are the types of things that a lot of people that have the extra money or want to maybe say they're worried about their dollar being worth less in the bank today or in five years' time than today, they'll buy something where they can store that value. Yeah, yeah, very good point. Well, a lot of people are arguing about whether we will have inflation or deflation. I mean, the vast majority of people say inflation, and I happen to be in that camp. But do you need a, a recovery to have inflation? I say you don't. Because if you look at inflationary economies throughout history, I mean, I don't think anyone would argue that Zimbabwe or Argentina or Hungary or the Weimar Republic were really recovering economies, but they still had massive inflation, right? And ultimately, you can argue that it led to their decline. Oh, of course, yeah. And you're right. So you don't recovery is not a needed part of that recipe. But what is needed is just a, a rampant printing or of money where this loaf of bread, and we all have heard that German, you know, the German... The loaf of bread is a dollar today, and it cost me a hundred dollars next month. That's rampant, rampant inflation. And if you own that bread, rather than the dollars, you're gonna, you know, insulate yourself from that devaluation. And that's what a lot of people are doing with swagger. And you've seen that happen both in the in the in the gold market, a big rally. Now it's come off a little bit, but definitely with real estate and definitely energy prices, and as well as the art market. Yeah. So what is going on in the art market? Is it is it is it going crazy? Yeah, I mean, they're seeing all-time record highs for art, and it's it's partly because the one percenters, and, and this is a, another big discussion, but, you know, there there's a place that they can put, or people that have that capital want to put it to store it, keep the dollar strong, or at least hedge themselves against that inflation. But at the same time, they'd also like to maybe benefit from a rising price. So there's two things going on there. You know, they say, only ever buy art if you really, really like it. But I think that with some of the things I've seen being sold at some of the prices, 
I think it's more of a store of wealth <laughs> than something that's actually pleasing to the eye. So we've got a rampant art market. We've got a very healthy wine market. Silver and gold have also gone up over time. They've backed off as of late. And energy, we all know what's happening with those prices, and, and, and you're a real estate expert. So those types of things are really where people are looking to continue to put their money because they don't trust the stock market, see? So there's a lot of flow in that area, and that's something that's unregulated and illiquid, so those things need to be put out there to be – those are danger signs. But at the same time, they also can be very good places – to put some of your money, but not all of it. And I think the distinction that has to be made in art is that it has to be really to have liquidity and the market is small for it, but it needs to be really exclusive art. There's a lot of this like middle market art. There's this huge middle area of art that just, it just really has no market. I mean, if you go to the website like artbrokerage.com, you know, you can see the same pieces Sit, that have been sitting there forever, offered by the same sellers. It, it's just, it's kind of crazy. Like, I, I just don't think there's much liquidity in that. You know, the value, they say, well, okay, the value for your painting is $30,000, but is there a buyer? <laughs> well, that's a, that's another old trader saying. I, and nothing's worth anything unless you've got a guy that wants to pay something for it. So it's only worth whatever the next bid is. So. Yeah, right. Exactly. That's the ultimate appraisal. It's not having an appraiser come over and speculate. <laughs> right. So you're right. You know, it's going to be upper end things. And, and it's, you know, the you can go, I mean, even, you know, it's the Leroy Neiman-ish things that might get a little bit of a bid that way. But you're right. There's a lot of stuff in the middle area that, you know, is either replicated or isn't, is, uh, is, is exclusive. But those are the types of things that, you know, can help maybe the average everyday investor puts a little bit of money towards something like a Neiman or, you know, but at the end of the day, we are putting so much money to work here that maybe when this inflation does pop, it pops faster than we all think, or at least we don't see it happening when it finally really does. Very interesting. Well, what are your other thoughts on the economy in general? I mean, you don't believe that we're in a, a real recovery, do you? No. And you know, I, I'm an, I'm kind of in my own camp on that. I, a lot of people really want to see the world through rose colored lenses and, Boy, we have one good jobs number uh, last November e- the 8th, and we have a retail sales number that was okay e- the other day, and all of a sudden we're on a road to recovery. Well, every other economic figure that came out was bad. It was worse than expected. So we've got a situation here where we're putting $85 billion to work, and I've said it a bunch of times, but I want to stress how much money that is. And the best we can do is a one5 to 2% growth rate. Yeah. It's I mean, aren't we embarrassed? I mean, if I would have told you the inputs, about what we're doing to, this, to stimulate this economy and put you in a, in a vacuum room, you would have come out thinking, you know, we've got to be growing at 5 6 maybe even 7%. But we're not. Yeah. But we're not. So we should be embarrassed. I mean, this talk of taper frustrates me because of we're, we're still in such dicey ground. So, so what you're talking about is, you know, the talk about the Fed tapering, you know, that, that has been the, the theory or the threat, and they're not going to do it now. Now, we've got a new Fed chair coming on board, and I want to ask you about Janet Yellen, too. But, I, I mean, there's, they're not going to taper, are they, anytime well, soon? Well, yeah, the, the tapering is of, of the $85 billion. Are they going to pull that away or how they're going to pull it away? But if they pull the, the party, the punch bowl away from the party, per se, and we're only managing one and a half to two percent growth now. I, the argument would be that the reason that they pull it away is that we're doing better and the economy can stand on its own. But I don't think anybody can sit here and say that the economy can stand anywhere on its own because of a 7.3 percent unemployment rate, 48 million people on food stamps. I mean, we are setting some records here, which are the opposite of the stock market record we set today. So we've got two different worlds we're living in, and unfortunately. We're trying to bring the gap between rich and poor closer. But by accommodating the economy with this money that we're doing on every, mo- every month, the people that own stocks or the people that own real estate or maybe the people that can afford to invest in swagger are the ones that are benefiting from all this money being put to work. And I think it's leaving a lot of us other people behind. I think it's leaving Main Street behind. And that's why a lot of these economic figures are coming in so poor. Those are all Main Street numbers, you know, foreclosures. Uh, I know that they're declining, but that just means less people are going bankrupt. That's not really a good thing. I mean, it's starting to heal a little bit, but you've got other economic figures that are showing that, you know, we're just not really getting off of our chairs and getting this thing back to work. So a large part of the economy, which could be arguably the 99 percenters, still are feeling the, the doldrums of 2009. 
So we've got two economies happening here, and unfortunately what the Fed's doing is really only benefiting one of them, which is very interesting about how that will all end in the next five years. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. So do you think do you think Janet Yellen will be more loose than Ben Bernanke and Greenspan, the ultimate Keynesian? Well, really, ben, maybe Bernanke is. I don't know who's worse. But do you think she'll even be more liberal in her quantitative easing? Uh, or uh, or do you think she'll pull in the reins at all? I mean, just even a little bit? Yeah, you know, the, everybody wants her to pull the reins in. And, and everybody thinks they know who she is. And I think for every Fed chair, we all thought we knew who they were. In the, end, in the end, we didn't. But I will say this. She's entering, I mean, she, she's entering a situation where we haven't even touched on, you know, Obamacare is arguably between 18 to 22 percent of our GDP. If that doesn't go well, she's going to have 20 percent of her GDP take a little bit of a knock. At the same time, we've got the high unemployment rate. Maybe we're going to need to see a bunch of jobs numbers in a row to change any of these bad feelings. There could be, you know, there could be a situation or an argument made that she might even put her foot on the gas and accommodate the economy more. Now, on a uh, percentage terms basis, Japan's putting more to work in their economy percentage-wise than we are for ours. So you've got some doves that will – doves are people that think, hey, we can put more economy, you know, more money in, in the economy. We can cut interest rates more. Those folks think that, hey, we can do just that because look at what the rest of the world's doing. All these central banks are on a race to cut interest rates to zero and accommodate their economy with all this cash. So there could be a chance. I mean, there could be a chance. It's not talked about wildly right now because the market wants her to taper, but or at least pull back on those uh, the money being put into the system. There's a chance that she actually puts more in. Mm, yeah, yeah. So that means more inflationary pressure, folks. You heard it right there. So what do, what do you think about the stock market? I mean, the Dow recently hit new highs. What's such a joke about this CNBC and putting the big notices on the screen is they never adjust for inflation. It's so ridiculous. I mean, when it just got over 15,000, I said, hey, nothing has happened yet. It's got to be at 15,800 by my calculations before you even break even <laughs> from the You're prior right. peak. Yeah. And I've been doing it for 26 years, and, you know, in 1996, we heard uh, Alan Greenspan as an irrational exuberance speech, right? Well, I've renamed 2013 Irrational Apathy. Uh, there were no media. There was no news trucks. We didn't have anybody really uh, cheerleading the rally because a lot of folks, and rightfully so, they can make an argument. They, think, they feel as though because of the money being put to work in the economy, and the money managers that have your 401k, my 401k, everybody else's 401k, feel this pressure to get involved in the stock market. They don't want to be left behind. So we have this self-fulfilling prophecy of this rally to the upside, and it feels manufactured. And I think that's what most people are really out there feeling. But just because it feels manufactured, and you and I both may think that, doesn't mean it can't continue on for another two years. So like I said about you know what we were talking about earlier, sometimes – Knowing what you think should happen versus what's going to happen, you can you can save yourself a lot of money by trading what's going to happen or at least working around what's going to happen and trying to benefit from that rather than be the fly on the windshield and be dead right. Very good point. Very good point. So wh what do you think the, the strategy is for uh, baby boomers and, and really Gen Xers now need to start thinking about it. I mean, if they're older Gen Xers, they're they're getting close to to where they have to start thinking about getting serious with their, their money and protecting their retirement. What can they do to shore up their finances so that they're just not left empty-handed at retirement? Oh, gosh, the answer isn't one anybody is going to want to hear because it affects me as well. But at the end of the day, you know, I own a money management firm and we talk to people all the time and folks that are Baby boomers are now starting to retire, and they've got a wall of baby boomers that are becoming true, and they can't really afford to have the stock market back up 20 or 30 percent on them, have some cataclysmic, you know, catastrophic crash. So they've been backing money out of the stock market, and really the only place they can put it to keep it safe is in bonds. Well, a 10-year bond is high today at 2.8 percent for 10 years, which is still ridiculous, ridiculously low. So, and I've written a piece about this as well. Unfortunately, we're going to see more 90-year-olds serving us ice cream at Dairy Queen, and I might be one of them. But the best way, the best way to shore up with some of these, these portfolios is that we're going to have to work longer. I mean, there is no, there's no easy way out because I can't look a 70-year-old 70, 70 person in the face and say, I need you to be 50-50 stocks, bonds. 
because that would be just a disaster to their portfolio if we had a real big backup in stocks. Some, you know, there are even people out there now predicting Dow 2000. I mean, hey, 2000. Yeah, well, I mean, I, <laughs> that, 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 that would be a complete collapse. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I don't think they'll ever allow that to happen because they can just print more fake money. And, you know, it might yeah, be 2000 right. in real value in real dollars, but not in nominal. Well, I mean, and, and where those two lines cross and those lines are this. When the government's continuing with its its uh, its accommodation versus when that growth comes, you know, so they're gonna they're gonna accommodate to some degree until we can finally see that growth, and then things will get safer, and then I can say to the seven year old, well, you know what, you can have a little bit more in equities now because I think this is healthier. But right now, there really is no good answer. I mean, the best answer is that you're gonna have to put in your plans working longer. And, and, and longer than you ever thought in order to save and be able to be okay in your older years. Because, and I'm one of them, I'm not trying to tell anybody that I'm not, I'm, I'm 50. So we're going to have to do that in order to stick around because I can't really take a huge hit to my 401k now, you know, if I'm getting out in 15 years. So the kids at 20, 25, 30, but they don't have a ton of money, but they're the ones that are going to be invested heavily in stocks right now. And there really isn't a cheap answer except for, uh, you know, we're going to have to work longer. And I hate to say it, but that's, that's, that's a lot of... Uh, you know, you know I, I really don't think that's such a terrible thing. I mean, the whole concept of retiring at 65 was created, you know, it's an industrial era. It's an artifact, okay? Right. I mean, it, it, it shouldn't be that way. People should be working longer. And I don't say that as like an obligation. They should want to. You retire, you, you die. I mean, people, you know, it's proven that when people retire they don't have a purpose. They don't have a sense of purpose, usually. Now, sometimes they have some other big, fulfilling sense of purpose. I mean, the, the point is to stay engaged, stay interested, and to work because you want to, not because you have to, because it's interesting, because you, you feel you're contributing to the world, you're contributing to yourself, you're growing, you're thinking, you're engaged, and, you know, it keeps you sharp. Hopefully not because you're an indentured servant and you're a Walmart greeter, okay? <laughs> that's, that's right, not and, the, and, you know, and, and to your other. point, you know, that, that industrial age retirement thing, you know, it, as a percentage of, the, of, of life expectancy, we should expect to work longer because we live a lot longer now. Uh, you know, back in the days when they, you know, when Social Security was put forward. You know, those we we need to start making those expectations, and we're building those into our customers' plans as well. And generally speaking, I think a lot of people have come to accept that anyway. So here we sit in an environment where we've got a manufactured stock market. We've got very very cheap money for ten years, so it's going to be difficult for you to pile all your money into that uh, that ten year interest rate. Uh, and your bond ladders are going to look not good. So that's going to be pretty much the commonsensical solution where you're going to be able to, you know, store some wealth, you know, m maybe uh, maybe if you can afford it, buy some of those other things that we talked about with Swagger. But at the end of the day, you're going to have to work a little bit longer. You don't have to work your, you know, your 80-hour work weeks, but you're going to have to keep some income coming in. It's not, it's not something you're going to have to have a ball and chain around your ankle, but you're going to have to keep some income coming in. Yeah, right, right, exactly. Well, any other points you'd like to make? Predictions on the future? Just ideas you want to close with? Any other thoughts? Uh, yeah, I, I do think I do think that we, we need to talk about, and this could be another talk sometime later, but we need to talk about that inflation problem, which I think will, could rear its ugly head before we actually know it, because there's going to be some point in time where things do catch fire, and maybe it's three or four jobs numbers, and you know, per, you know, uh, three or four months of good jobs numbers where that does finally happen. But people have got to be ready for that, A, in their borrowings, because a lot of people might be going month to month on some sort of interest rate. But you're going to see those types of things. Make sure that your borrowings are, can handle a doubling of the interest rate. See, that's, that's, that's a big deal. Percentage change versus the actual change. Well, 2 to 4% doesn't seem like a big deal, but it doubles your payment. So you have to keep those types of things in mind. So keep Keep in mind a sudden change to inflation, I think you'd be okay, because that really is the thing I think that's going to erode people's wealth going forward. So so long-term fixed rate debt, hopefully attached to some of the swagger items. I love it when it's on real estate because inflation <laughs> inflation actually works for you. It pays your debt off for you, you know, in that case. It it devalues your debt, which is which is awesome. That's what we want. Right. But but it's gotta be fixed rate, folks, because it's just too risky to have adjustable rates in, in this kind of uncertain market. Good stuff. Scott, give out your website. Tell people where they can find you. Well we're at uh, www.thetreengroup.com. My 
face will be uh, on the front page there. You can get in touch with me on that one. Uh, that'd be probably the best and, and most easiest way. And I just want to I just want to spell that for everybody. It's it's t r e a n group dot com. Yes. Good stuff. Well, Scott Shalliday, thank you so much for joining us today. All right, thank you, Jason. This show is produced by the Hartman Media Company, all rights reserved. For distribution or publication rights and media interviews, please visit www.hartmanmedia.com or email media at hartmanmedia.com. Nothing on this show should be considered specific personal or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own, and the host is acting on behalf of Platinum Properties Investor Network, Inc., exclusively.